Highway and join us this morning. Our call to worship is found on page 252. We'll sing the first and last verses of the Glory Land Way.
affirmation of faith, uh, which is the Apostles' Creed, printed in your bulletin this morning. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Alright, we'll turn to page 92. We're going to sing um, all three verses of Victory in Jesus, 92. Mm -hmm.
commit to how to preach. Actually, when I first went to Samuel's Chapel years ago, they sang out the Heavenly Highway hymns. And uh, a lot of those songs, the Glory Land Way, when the soul never dies, uh, I've never sung them before. I don't know that I ever heard them, but maybe I had. Uh, I was used to contemporary music, and it was a little bit of an adjustment for me, but, uh, you know, I found myself after a time singing those songs under my breath as I rode down the road, drove down the road, and as I worked, as I was typing on the computer, and uh, I still do. Brought uh, a little bit of different perspective, and it's uh, a lot of great words in those old hymns. I'm glad we've taken uh, the time to uh, not forget and to sing those songs. I'm going to be sharing with you this morning uh, from Acts chapter 1. Uh, I may read from uh, Matthew a little bit later. Uh, I'm going to read the first eight verses in chapter 1, uh, book of Acts. Uh, widely recognized as Luke as the author. And he says, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions to the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. May God, God bless the reading and hearing of his word today.
second one, Joe was at earlier. Please say that it's more the spirit of the world today. Let's bow our heads. Most gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for, for being good to us. Lord, I thank you for all the things you showered down upon us. And Lord, I pray for this time that you bless these ties and offerings that we are about to receive. Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
try to get your attention. I, uh, it's just something that, that really uh, came, up, came up yesterday. I have tended to preach from Matthew chapter 5. But uh, we went to a uh, district training event yesterday at Camp Sumatana. And uh, really didn't know what to expect. But uh, I, uh, I can tell you, I, I was quite moved and touched. Uh, I thought our district superintendent, Robin Scott, did a fantastic job. Uh, and as far as I know, he didn't mention Acts chapter 1. But it's just something that came to, to my mind and what he was talking about. And it was a district training event about uh, rising up new leaders in the church. And I thought that was kind of interesting and ironic, and somewhat of a coincidence, even though we don't believe in coincidences in our household, that we're talking about church leadership tonight in our meeting at 6 o'clock. So I hope everyone will be there. But the main point I think that I took away from yesterday was, was really more than rising up new leaders in the church. It was more really along the lines of our Sunday school lesson this morning about accountability and forgiveness and unity in the church. And I think if we can establish those things that we, can, that we can be more of what God wants us to be here on earth. It's kind of a scary proposition. When you start talking about church growth, that's a big subject, mainly because most of the churches today are declining. Most of the churches today are shrinking. Uh, the roles are getting smaller. Attendance is dropping and leaps and bounds everywhere. Uh, there are certain spots where churches are growing, uh, and they seem to be doing quite well. It made me take calls to <coughs> South Africa, to really think about what we're doing here at Port Mendy United Methodist Church. Um, there's not a whole lot that we can do uh, to impact in a major way things outside of these walls, outside of our community, our state. But I think those days could come. And I just wanted us to just stop for a second today and just uh, just maybe just each one of us take our little handheld mirror out and look at ourselves. And collectively, let's all look at uh, ourselves as a church, as a, as a group, as a body of Christ and, and what we're doing. Which led me to the scripture today, and specifically talking about uh, verse 8. So it says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And don't worry, I'm not asking anybody to go on a mission trip. I'm not asking anybody to, to sign up to be a missionary and to go to foreign lands to do anything. But what I am asking each one of us to do today is to stop for a second and just look at ourselves. Let's just be honest. Are we doing what God wants us to do? Are we fulfilling our pledge to Him and to this church and more importantly to ourselves? You know, the scripture today talks about Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and into the earth. And I was, uh, I was reading a campaign that the church was doing, and I forget which church it was, but, but they kind of equated Jerusalem being to their community. Uh, important being, gas right here, closely uh, knit. Judea being maybe the county or even the state that they lived in. And Samaria, which as many of you may know, Samaria in those days were, uh, was a 
place that was just off limits. You just didn't walk through. You didn't go through Samaria. <laughs> that was a place where the outcasts were. Those were the bad people. You didn't hang out with those kind of folks. Those were the folks that lived across the track over there in Samaria. You didn't hang out with them. So maybe that's some place that, you know, for us to represent places that we wouldn't normally go. And then to the ends of the earth, which for them was probably about a thousand mile radius, but we know for us the ends of the earth is a pretty long way. And, uh, and I know that when a church like ours nestled here in the quaint little community in Horton Bend, reaching out to the ends of the earth seems like something that's just hard to wrap our heads around. It's hard to comprehend. But I'll tell you how easy it could be. Mary Jean, hold up that box. That, that, that box right there, it actually folds up to a, to a small box about the half the size of a normal shoe box. Maybe the size of a child's shoe box is what that is. And uh, yesterday they, uh, they, passed, they, had, they passed around a sheet and they asked us as a conference, and I'm sure lots more people are doing it, I don't know who all is doing it, but they asked us to take a box and put some items in there for needy children in third world country. And uh, I've heard about these things before. We've done a few little things that over the years. But you know, I just it just really kind of hit me yesterday. You know, putting you know, my wife is a dental hygienist. You know, she buys toothbrushes, she gets toothbrushes to give to her. We've got box full of toothbrushes. It's not a big deal for me. That's something I just take for granted. We got plenty of toothpaste. Sure, there are people out there, there's kids in this world don't have a toothbrush. There are kids right here in this community that don't have a toothbrush. But let alone the third world country. I just thought, man, <clears throat> there's been days when I've gotten in a truck headed to work and I forgot to brush my teeth. And I'm just thinking, oh God, I'm glad I've got a toothbrush on my desk. I, mean, I couldn't imagine doing all day without brushing my teeth. Some of these kids go months or years without brushing their teeth. Just a little something like that. You know, we could make a difference for somebody in Central America, South America, Southeast Asia, Asia, and Africa. I don't know where the boxes are going, but they're going somewhere in some way that needs them. So I told Mary Jean, and I said, how many people are going to get five of those boxes? I said, you know, we're going to announce it to the church tomorrow, and hopefully people in the church will have a compassion for those kids that don't have anything and will volunteer to help fill up those boxes. And I said, and I told this, I said, if nobody at the church wants to help, I said, we'll fill it. But I know in my heart that you'll do it. And I just took five. We can get more. Five's not all we have to do. But that's just one simple way how Horton Band United Methodist Church could reach out and change somebody to the ends of the earth. Now, they may not know that the person who opens that box and enjoys the contents of it may never know that Horton Band United Methodist Church sent that to them. I don't know how that's going to work, and it doesn't really matter. We're not in it for the glory, for the recognition. But what really matters is that God gets the glory because that little person will know somehow, some way, that God provided that box for you. And we just help facilitate. That's just one little way that we can reach out and change the world. To the ends of the earth. Just put a few little items in a box. Changing our state, our surrounding region in the southeast, we can make a difference. You know, last weekend, Mary Jean and I went to Gunnersville and spent the night for our anniversary. And there happened to be a gentleman sitting there eating dinner beside us, and he was by himself, and we struck up a conversation. As it turns out, he was living, working there in Gunnersville, building publics up there, and his wife was down in Florida. And, you know, just a little interaction that we had 
uh, I hope that he took a little bit of the friendship that, uh, that we try to offer to a stranger in a strange land. He'll take that back to Florida with him. Hey, the third folks in Alabama are, are fairly nice. And they love people from a strange land. But you know, our training out the, uh, our training uh, session yesterday, and, and I know Joey went through this uh, with us yesterday, so it's kind of re refreshing for him. But there was just there were several things in this, and I'm, I'm not going to just go through the whole thing because Robin talked for uh, about four hours yesterday, and I was just shocked. I figured there'd be several people presenting. He got up there and did the whole thing and did a fantastic job. And just a few things that I wanted to point out, and, and, and I want to go into this into more depth in a later time, but here's some really good points that I wanted us to just think about. You know, as I, I think that each one of us have expressed a desire to grow. We'd like to see the pews filled. We'd like to see more people experiencing the love of Jesus here at Fort Benning United Methodist Church. We'd like to see the kingdom grow, and we'd like to be a part of that growth. But uh, the word that kept coming up yesterday is we have to be intentional about what we're doing. We can't just sit back and, and say that we want to grow and then just hope to grow. I mean, we don't just go out there and dig a hole and put a tomato plant in it and sit back there on the porch and say, I hope that tomato plant grows. I mean, there's a lot of things that you got to do to it. you got to cultivate the soil, you got to hoe it, you got to water it, you got to fertilize it, you got to prune it, you got to stake it, you got to take care of it. You got to be intentional if you want tomatoes. And folks, if we want to see some tomatoes here in our garden, then there's some things that we've got to do. We just got to be intentional about it. Now, don't think for a second I'm standing up here telling you that I'm an expert about how to get it done because I don't know. But one thing that I do know is that God knows how to do it. We just got to seek His guidance for our future. Uh, a few things, uh, points that I want us to just think about. You know, if we went around and asked the room, somebody would have asked me yesterday, who are you trying to attract? Who would we like, to, if we want our church to grow, well, what would be the demographic? Who are the people that you're trying to reach? Well, I would have probably said, Anybody that will come through the door to you to shake your head. And, and, and you know, and, and that's fine today, but it's not really practical. You know, you're just kind of shooting a shotgun out there trying to hit something. It's, it's about being intentional. And, and, and I tell you, Robin shared these, these points here uh, that he took from Rick Warren's book, The Perfect Good Life. So Robin stole them from Rick Warren, and I'm stealing them from Robin, and Rick Warren probably stole them from somebody else. I don't know if he may have come up with it. But there's, there's five groups of people, and I'm not going to bore you with all the details this morning, but the first group is just the community. We're trying to reach the people out there in the community that don't know the church. I heard a staggering statistic yesterday, and I had never heard this one before, that today, August 10th, 2014, that's right here. I do that a lot of times when I say the wrong year, Mary Jane was correct. 75% of the people in Alabama will not be in church today. And I meant to look it up and I forgot it. And I think there's about 5 million people in, uh, in Alabama. Give or take. I think that's about right. Maybe not a million, but let's just go with five million for a day. So that means that 3,750,000 people today are not in church. That doesn't mean that they, some of them may not go back next week or in the weeks to come. But at any point in time, there are only 25% of the people in Alabama going to church. When people uh, say, and they do say this, well, we just can't find anybody that will come to church. Folks, there's a lot of folks out there that we can invite. 3,750,000 people is a lot of folks. 
The next group is the crowd. First group is the community, second group is the crowd. I think. These are the folks who come to church occasionally. They come to church occasionally, every now and then. Say they come, normally those folks in the crowd will come on Easter, they'll come on uh, New, uh, Christmas Eve, maybe they'll come on Mother's Day, and a couple other occasions. They may come to a, a baptism of a family member, they may go to a wedding, they may go to a funeral. But uh, occasional attenders of church, and there are a lot of folks out there that are like that. And next we have the congregation, the third group. There are folks who would be classified as regular attenders. This was another uh, fact that really shocked me yesterday. When you ask the general population of folks out there who consider themselves regular attenders, how many times do you think that they come a month? Regular attenders. Joe, you're not allowed to answer that. <laughs> Two? She's close, but she went over. One. Regular attenders in church consider if they go to church one time a month, they consider themselves regular attenders. So I got to thinking back, uh, I think I filled in here in October and started here regular November maybe, something like that. Uh, I've been here every Sunday. I think. I'm not saying that right. I think I've been here every Sunday. Now, I have an incentive to be here every Sunday. Um, but you know, there is, uh, in, in the general church population, uh, Robin mentioned this yesterday, a regular attender to him is somebody that comes three out of four, 75%. But you know, that's still, still, that's missing 13 Sundays a year. 13 Sundays a year. That's a lot of Sundays to miss. Now, I understand we're all on vacation. I know that we can go to visit family. There's things that come up or sit. I understand. And those things happen. But still, there's, a, uh, there, there's something lost in the church today about uh, the responsibility and obligation we feel to be a part of the congregation. The next group that we have that we're trying to reach as a church is the committee. They are the, the church members that are here most every Sunday. Uh, they serve on committees, uh, they're in worship, uh, they're the next leaders of, of the church, but they're not uh, chairmen of any committees. Which leads us to the last group, the core group of the church, those that are involved, those that are committed. You remember the analogy of the chicken and the pig? You know, it's nice to have folks that are involved, but we really want folks that are committed. We want folks that are really uh, willing to, to give in to their time and their talents. Uh, they're the ones that uh, they help chart the vision of the church. So there's five groups of folks that, that we want to, that we're trying to reach. And, and each one of those we're trying to reach in different ways for different reasons. I think the, the way that we approach the core group of the church uh, would be different, I think everyone would agree, than the way that we would approach the community or the crowd out there. Because they have different ideas, they have different expectations, so they have different needs for the, for the church. But those are the folks that we're we're trying to reach out there. Now, how are we going to reach them? Well, I don't have that answer for you today. I wish I had a, a, a three-point plan with, with several sub-points there, that just, just the, the best way to go, but I don't have that today. I think God will give us that plan if that's something we truly are looking for. And there's, uh, there's, some, there's five other points here that I just want to mention to you that was a part of this uh, presentation yesterday. And as, we, as we're looking for those new folks to come in the door, and, and I've been that new person who came in the door, 
I told you about a time Mary Jean and I visited the church when we went in, we sat down and went through the service, and nobody spoke to us. On the way out, we were standing around the back of the church, and the preacher came by and shook her hand. And, uh, and basically, he said, as, as he was running out the door, you'll never find anybody, you'll never find a church who needs you worse than this one does. Glad to see you. And that was all I got for Couldn't find anybody to direct us to the Sunday school classes. We were we were going to go to Sunday school. Couldn't find them. It was very cold, very cold church, uh, which I don't think we are. I think we're very warm. I think we're welcome. I think we're a very loving church. I think that's a, uh, a great point. But but as people come in and they and they see our church. Maybe they're coming back. Maybe they've been in this church for 20 years and they've been gone for three or four years and they come back. They're going to ask these questions. Do I fit here? Is this a fit for me? Does anyone want to know me? Do we just shake their hand and ask them their name? Is it superficial or are we genuinely concerned about them? Am I needed here in this church? Does anybody uh, see value in me joining this church? And then what is the advantage of joining the church? Now, that's a question that, that people ask. Well, I've, I've been in churches where people go, uh, go to a church for years and years and years, and they never make the step of joining the church. They ask the question, well, what's the advantage of, of joining the church? You know, we don't really offer discount. You know, for any reason, you know, there has to be a reason that they want to join. And then the last question that they may ask is, what is required of the members? What's required? If I do join, what's going to be required? What are the expectations? And, and one thing that, uh, that I do want to share with you, a note that I, that I took yesterday, Robin shared this, and this was this was true, and Mary Jean have experienced this firsthand, and I know this to be a fact. But the churches out there in the United States today that are growing, they have one thing in common, at least one thing, maybe more. But one thing that they have in common is they have higher expectations than other churches. Of their pastors, of their staff, of the congregation of their new members. They have higher expectations. And, and that really hit me yesterday. That, uh, you know, that maybe we have just been too passive in our attempts to grow in the United Methodist Church. I think about that. And I think about the churches that I've gone to that, uh, that are growing, that are thriving, and that is a common thread in those churches. <clears throat> I want to share with you a scripture that you've heard many, many times before. It goes along with Acts chapter 1, and it's the Great Commission. It comes from Matthew. 16 through 20, it says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain, where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you, always, to the very end. So Jesus tells us in Acts that we should go. You know, we should go out to Port Bend. We should reach out to, to Gas in the state of Alabama, across the tracks, where places we normally don't go, out to the ends of the earth, to the edges of the United States, to, to nations that are needy. 
South America, Central America, Africa, Southeast Asia, wherever they may be. Jesus commands us to do that. And, and those may seem, as I said earlier today, those may seem just overwhelming to us as we sit here, all 15 of us. You know, what difference can we possibly make in this world, here in this community? There's just 15 of us. You heard me say it lots of times, you probably hear me say it lots more, but look what Jesus did with 12. Obvious next statement is, well, you know, I ain't Jesus. And I understand that. But I'm not the one that's going to make this happen. It's the Holy Spirit that's going to make this happen in each one of us. As we seek God's will for our lives, as we reach out and try to grow His kingdom, as we try to fulfill the great commission that Jesus commanded us to do is we, is we go out and we reach out. You know, whether it's with a hand or a letter or stuff in a box that we ship around the world. You know, Horton Bay United Methodist Church can make a difference. It's just a matter of whether or not we want to. As I said, I don't have all the answers about how we're going to get there or how all that's going to happen. But I do, do know that with God's help and, and our commitment, God can change us so that we can help change the lives around us. I, I don't know about you. I, I don't know how you feel when you leave here on Sunday. You may, you may look at person in the car you're riding with or by yourself or look in the mirror and say, golly, man, I just don't think I can sit and do another one of those sermons. You may look and say, golly, man, I feel really uplifted. I know that when I leave here on Sunday, I usually feel a little bit tired. But I also feel uplifted because of each one of you. Each one of you make a difference in my life. You uplift me. You encourage me so that I can go out on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and hopefully make a difference in people's lives that I connect with. And I think that, that if we can think of it in those terms, how we can encourage each other and one another, how we can make a difference in people's lives, that's what Jesus wants us to do. That's what the body of Christ is meant to do. And he's given us this great concept of church and congregation, the body of Christ so that we can band together and make the body of Christ grow and touch more people's lives. So I just submit to you today to, that with God's help and the power of the Holy Spirit, all things are possible. All things are possible. We just have to be willing to allow God to work in our lives. And I'll be the first one to stand up here and admit that for years and years, I put this shield up and said, I'm not interested. That's somebody else's problem. Let them do it. That's not my gift. That's not my bag. There are other people that are better suited for that. Let them do it. And God just convicted me. And he said, Joe, he said, there's more that you can do. He said, I have blessed you so much and you've just been slack. And he was right. Just, con just convicted me right down to my very soul. Now, I may not always do the right things. I may not always say the right things. But I can tell you that I want to please Him, and I want to see His kingdom grow on this earth. I wish I had all the answers, but I do. But He does. We just have to be willing to listen. And when we hear, we have to be willing to do. That's the answer. It may not happen today, May not happen next month, may not happen next year, but it will happen. If we'll listen, it will happen. I ask you to start today 
And let's make an earnest effort to pray each and every day for God to open up ways that we can serve Him better. And ways that we can help His kingdom to grow. Whether it's here in this community or somewhere else. I ask you to earnestly make that commitment to that. When I look around, I, 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 I wrote through here the other day, and I just and I just thought to myself, and this may sound real corny to you, but I thought to myself, I said, you know, this, this little church is a gold. This is a goal. Something wonderful can happen. And then I thought to myself, am I standing in a way of that goal rush happening? And I certainly hope not. More to me, I met mean, this church is a goal. And I just ask you to just help me. Help me in, in my efforts. In each one of our efforts to strike the bridge, to strike that goal, and to hit the jackpot. And let's do what God wants us to do. Let's bow our heads to the musicians. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for giving us all that we have here today. Lord, I pray that you'll give us strength and courage to capitalize on all that you've given us. Lord, I ask you to give us strength and courage to move forward. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.